Well, good morning. Come on, look at somebody next to you again. Just tell them how good they look and how glad you are that they got to, they're sitting next to you. Man, what a great day to be at church. We are uh, starting a new series today, Who Is This Man? I, I, I don't, I bet you don't know who we're going to talk about, uh, but who is this man? We're going to get into that in just a moment, but it's baptism day. And so, man, there are people that are, yeah, that are getting baptized. And if you are a family member or friend that's here to celebrate, um, man, have a great time. We hope that uh, you have a, a great time today. And then that'll be right after the service. Maybe you didn't come prepared to get baptism, uh, baptismed, uh, just created a verb. Um, uh, but you, you, there is something that stirs inside of you today, and we're just praying over you, praying over your heart that maybe there, it's time to get in the pool. It's time to, to step out, and, uh, and we're ready for you today if that is you. We've got clothes, and, or uh, man, we had somebody get in in their J's uh, last month, and so pretty bold right there, pretty committed for Jesus when you step into the baptism pool with your Jordans on. But, um, but how we're ready for that, and the Lord is ready uh, for you. There is an appointment that he has with you today, wants to speak to you, wants to move on your heart, and we've been uh, so expectant for what God wants to do in this next season. You know, Easter isn't the end, it's the beginning. There's this stirring and there's this thing that begins to happen in us and, and uh, as grow nights uh, begin to get amped up for May, we're just so excited about the growth that's going to happen in us and, and what God is wanting to do as we head into this next season. Uh, come on, say this with me. Who is this man? The, uh, the answer to that question is the most important question that we'll ever answer. And, and it's not just a salvation question. Uh, it is a, it's a daily question uh, that reflects the, the level of commitment we have in our lives with, with Jesus, how committed we are uh, to him. Uh, our founding pastors that were one day, my, uh, at, one day at one time were my youth pastors, um, they, they used to say to us, you have as much of Jesus today as you want. You, you, have, you have as much of him as, as you want. He has made himself completely available at the cross but, but the way we engage in that relationship uh, through the cross, we don't leave the cross behind, but we, we go through the cross into man, resurrection life and what, what he has for us. And so we've got to answer that, that question. Uh, he has received, Jesus has received more adoration, criticism, devotion, and opposition than any person in history. Every word and deed have been studied, scrutinized, compared, and dissected. This one life impacts every single life on earth. Every person that has ever lived, every person that is living, and every person that will ever live, uh, it affects what the answer to this question is, uh, affects uh, his life. James Allen Francis says this. He says he never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never uh, owed, uh, uh, owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of these things that usually accompany greatness. 19 wide centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. He says, I am within the mark when I say that all of the armies that ever marched, all of the navies that ever were built, uh, were built, all of the parliaments that ever sat, all of the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of a man upon this earth as powerfully as has this one solitary life. His life has affected every single one of us, and, and even those that don't believe yet, even those that, that don't know the answer to this question of who is this man, uh, still he has affected their life. But, but let me ask you something. If we know what Jesus has done and we know who he is, who is the living, breathing answer to the question, who is this man? So Jesus is the answer, but, but who, is the, who is the answer to the world. How do we help answer this question everywhere we go? Whether you're a student or, or adult, whether you are tall or whether you are short, no matter what place, no, no, no matter what demographic, no matter where you were born, we all carry the answer to this question. And it's to us. So he is the answer to us. Jesus is this man. 
But, but then he is also the answer through us to a world that is still asking the question. Here's how we know they're asking the question, because if you were to look up the results on Google, there's two billion results to the question, who is Jesus? Two billion. That's a lot of, that's a lot of searching about who Jesus is. Do you know that people are still asking who Jesus is today? And, and, and so here's the thing about out of these 2 billion results, there's two things uh, that are true. Um, the, the first thing is they can't all be right. So out of the 2 billion answers, they, they can't all be right because for something to be true, something also has to be not true. Does that, does that make sense? So if God is love, he can't be hate. Does that make sense? I know it's this is like college level right here. I mean, we're just... Argument, argument, uh, 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 apologetics this morning. But, but then the same is true because there's so much, it can't be all false. So somewhere in, in the bathwater is the baby. You know what I'm saying? And you can't just throw it all out. You can't get so frustrated that there's, so, there's two billion. How are we ever going to find the truth? There is truth in it. His name is Jesus. So... <laughs> So somewhere in all of the searching, there is some truth. So we can't just, we can't just throw it all, all out. Uh, you said, Michael, why, why are we doing a series on Jesus? Didn't we just celebrate Jesus at Easter? And, and, and some of us, we sit and we go, man, I know the answer to that question. I, I know who Jesus is, and I'm so glad you do. But the reason we've got to talk about this, and we've got to start talking about it in church, is so we know how to talk about it at work. We know how to talk about it in our homes. We know how to talk about it and live it in our schools. We know how when we're pressed with everything else, where people are trying to make Jesus a question, there is somebody living in this world that is able to make Jesus an exclamation point. If we're really going to make Jesus famous, that's not something that's said. It's something that's lived. It comes out in who I am. It's a part of who we are. By the way, he did give us his name, Christian, Christ-like. But now you throw that out. And you can be a Christian, but under you, you, everything is lumped into Christian. And, and, and the two bit, listen, the two billion people that say, hey, they, they, that, or they would be considered under the Christian faith or Christian religion. Listen, we have cults that are considered a part of the Christian faith. If you believe in works and believe that works get you to heaven, you're considered a Christian as long as you say Jesus or he's a part of your theology. But there are so many things that we have been duped into. There are so many things that the world is believing in that is not going to get them to heaven because there is by one, one person that we're saved, one being that we have to believe in when you believe in Jesus. That's how salvation comes. And as good as you get and as good as I get, there is nothing in our goodness that can bring something to God. He is the one that brings the goodness to you and me. And out of that relationship, goodness comes. I know how to be a dad. I know how to be an employer, an employee. I know how to be a Christian, to be Christ-like. Jesus did not come to make you better or to make you good. He came to make you Christ-like so that you could look like him, so that you could be in fellowship and relationship with him. So who is this man? Who is this Jesus? There was a recent study done that asked this question, and 52% 52% of Americans said that Jesus is a good teacher, but not God. Wow. 52% of Americans answered the question and said, we, we believe he's a good teacher, but that he's not God. And was he a good, a good teacher? Is he a good teacher? Has Jesus taught you anything this week? Yeah. He's a good teacher, but he's so much more than that. So, so in the first installment, the first week of who is this man, I just want to start off by just declaring Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Out of all the two billion searches, out of all the two billion choices, Jesus is the best choice. He really is a great teacher, but he really is God. Fully God and fully man. And Jesus, he, he, he thought, hey, I mean, he didn't, it didn't have to occur to him. He knew there would be this giant question of people asking who he is. You know, the answer to that question is actually what got him killed. 
because he told them. There are these bold I am statements throughout the book of John, and I love the gospel of John. It is, it's not a synoptic gospel, so it's not the same as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It stands a little bit different because it was written later. But, but John takes these I am statements from Jesus' teaching, and, and through that, Jesus declares who he is and what he came to do. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to take a journey and just, I just think if, if, if we're going to figure out who Jesus is, maybe we should look at the Bible. We can Google it, or we can look at God's word that says, this is who I am, this is what I came to do. I love this, C.S. Lewis, uh, if you, those of you who have studied theology, or, or maybe you know you're a C.S. Lewis fan, you would know this, but this is, this is the trilemma. Think about this, stay, stay with me. I am trying, this is what he says, I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. Can I get an amen? All right. He says, a man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said uh, would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit on him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So so check it out. He's either a lunatic, he said some crazy things, and he really believes it. He's a liar. Don't leave, I promise I'll settle the tension. He's a liar. That means everything that he did say that was crazy is not true, or he is Lord. And everything he said is true. And so every single one of us have to come to terms with with that. Okay, so the apologetics is over. Let's let's move on. How do we answer this question, who is this man? There's a a, a Bible story in the Bible that uh, a Bible story in the Bible. That's that was emphasis because it's important to understand that it's a Bible story in the Bible. Jesus, and most of us are familiar with this, is Jesus feeding the the five thousand. People were hungry and Jesus fed them. And, and pretty miraculous story, we, we know all about that, but then he gets to the point where he teaches them. And so in this passage, in this context of John 6, a lot has happened. The people were hungry. They, they, uh, they, Jesus uh, or the disciples brought them to him and they said, hey, do we, need to, do we need to go get food? And he goes, no, just take this kid's snack. <laughs> and they took, they took the guy's uh, Zach snack or, or the, K, the, the uh, Captain D's and they, and they brought it. And then Jesus multiplied, he prayed over it. He gave it to the disciples and then it multiplied in their hands. Can anybody say miraculous? I mean, that's pretty cool. And you know, people were extra happy because it had something to do with food. That's not just for Baptists, that's for all of us. Something about food. And, and, and so God knew the, that the, the place, the, the path to their heart, the path to getting them to listen and to, to, to understand, he, he, he showed something from his hands. Uh, is anybody in the room thankful that God moves his hand on your behalf? I love that. I love that, I love that when I'm hungry, he feeds me. He nourishes me. He provides for me. I, I, I love that. And these people were excited about, man, we got food. We don't have to go anywhere else. And they stayed and they, they leaned in and they began to listen to him. But then Jesus goes away by himself and the people start asking the question that people are still asking today, where is Jesus? Even if they don't use those certain terms, those words, where is Jesus? Do you know that your kids that don't believe they're asking the question, where is Jesus? They, not, they may not be asking who is Jesus yet, and that's coming. Praying mama, praying granddad, praying family, it's coming. Who is Jesus? They, they will ask, who is Jesus? But, but everybody's wondering, well, how do we know this? Because the Old Testament tells us, Proverbs says that, that in the human heart, God has placed eternity. 
that there is this thing in all of us that wonders what is the answer to eternity, who is, where is Jesus? And, and so the disciples, and, and, and even, uh, and, and not the 12 disciples, but, but this group of followers in the crowd, they're asking this question in, in this context. They might have wanted more food. Are there leftovers? Or they may have wanted to hear teaching. They may have wanted to see a miraculous sign. Everybody comes to Jesus wanting something. You and I, we came wanting something. And these people do too. They're hungry. They want to know where Jesus is. And then Jesus is on the scene and he begins to answer. Verse 26 of John 6. He says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. Not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. So, so check this out. They wake up hungry and they want to find Jesus. Why are they looking for Jesus? Because they're hungry. Not because they're looking for Jesus but because they're looking for something Jesus can do for them. And people for centuries have been more focused on his power than his presence. I'm so thankful for his power. But Jesus is urging this group of the crowd and that even the disciples to a greater place. That what Jesus wants to do in his relationship with you is not lead you by his provision, but to lead you by his presence. That's who this man is. And they didn't get it. Because their stomach's growling. And whether it's the stomach of, or the stomach, the, uh, that, that's right. So the appetite or the desire of your stomach. How many of you, your spouse, when their stomach growls, it sounds like. Something's about to come out. It's. It's just disturbing. You're like, what is that? What, what is happening? Some of us get hungry and we get hangry. You ever seen a Snickers commercial? We get, that there are these things, that something happens. Some of us get headaches. Some of us become a headache. There are all these reactions, and, and so I want to help you connect to whether it's the physical reactions of hunger or whether our soul is desperate for something that we don't know the answer to or whether we're in a spiritual place of desperation. Wh whatever it is, Jesus is the one who meets our need. But it's not just his power or the thing that comes from his hand. It's the thing that comes from his heart, his very presence. Jesus didn't just come to do something. Jesus came to be someone. Are you tracking with me? So, so let's keep going. We're, we're going to be people of his presence, not just people of his, of his hand and his power. Because this is true for, for some of us too. They, they started demanding a sign. you got to be careful when you start demanding something of Jesus. Feed me, Seymour. <laughs> 80s or 90s? 80s? Okay. Verse 28. Says they replied, we want to perform God's works too. So what if they want to perform? They're not just wanting his presence. They want him to give, give them the power to, to multiply food. I, I, wonder if, I wonder if God gave us the power so that we could do things on our own and we didn't need him. Would we be okay with that? Ch check it out. Look at their motives. Their motive wasn't him. Their motive now moves beyond just them, him filling their stomach. Now they just want to be able to do the tricks that he does. And that they've got a story, y'all. They, they know their history, so they connect it to, to some other things. Check this out. It says, this is the only, uh, he says, we, we want to be able to do that. And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Well, where's the power, the presence, and the provision come from? Believing in the one he sent. Check this out. This is for all the only children and then everybody else just a little bit. The world doesn't revolve around you. I know. It's harsh. They've been telling me all my life. But it, it doesn't revolve around you. Remember Colossians 1? God says the world revolves around him. 
he is the one. He, he is the one. And he, and he can't, listen, the world can't revolve around just a good teacher. He's got to be more than that. Can I get an amen? I mean, there, there's more going on here. So I know, I know we're, 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 we're just, just stay tracking with me. I promise this is, we're going to bring this together. He says, we want to perform the miracles too. This is the only work God wants from you is to believe. And they answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. Come on, they know their history. So they start throwing history in Jesus' face. Hey, our, our ancestors, they ate manna. God provided the food for them. What are you going to do? Can we, can we do that same thing? Can we do that? Listen, this, this is, can you just imagine Jesus? Like I was just thinking all these times Jesus wanted to go. <laughs> or, you know the, emo, the emoji? <laughs> but he didn't. He hangs in there. You know why? Because he wants you to know who he is. He hangs in there with them. He is patient. I am so thankful for his patience here. It is so easy sometimes to read the scripture and judge the people that are doing dumb things. The whole job of a pastor is to help you say, hey, we do the dumb things too and we need Jesus. <laughs> because th this is right there. We're in this story. He says, what can you do? After all, they ate manna. Moses gave them bread from heaven. And so here's the deal. They wanted to be like Moses. Hey, we want to be what Moses did. We want to be able to do the things that Moses did. And look what Jesus turns it on him. He said, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give the bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. So now they're like, okay, that sounds good. We want it every single day. We like what we're hearing. But then in verse 35, dum, 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 give me that, dum, dum, dum. Verse 35, Jesus replied, I am, everybody say, I am. I am. The bread of life. That's where we're going to stick right here as we land the plane. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And so who is this man? He is God. When he said, I am, the audience would know what he was talking about. Because who brought up Moses, Jesus or them? Them, they know their history. And they would know when he said, I am, that's how Moses introduced himself in Genesis to God. I mean, to, in Exodus, how God introduced himself to Moses. Because, because Moses said, who am I going to, who, who, who am I going to say, send me? And he said, I am. So, the, so check it out. I love this. It's the burning bush. And it never went out. Moses has seen a ton of burning bushes. This was a bush that didn't go out. There are two million Google searches, but there is one that doesn't burn out. His name is Jesus. Is this life? Is this life? Does this feel good? Is this, that, this, that? Two million. We can't even comprehend all the questions, but there is one answer. His name is Jesus. And so there's this, this, this bush that doesn't go out, and it was, God, there's this voice that comes out of it. Now it's a talking bush. He goes, hey, Moses, you're hiding. And he says, come, you're on holy ground. Take off your shoes. God introduces himself to Moses. Moses introduces himself to God. Moses said, I am not. God says, I am. Because where you're not, he is. I am the great I am not, but he is the great I am. And then Jesus adds something to that so they would understand. Here's what happens. He said, I am the bread of life. Every single one of them would have went. <gasps> and that statement right there, I am, that's what Jesus got crucified for. That's, why he went, that's, that's not why he went to the cross, but that's, that was the kicker right there. The religious leaders crucified Jesus because he was a man that claimed to be God. But our salvation hinges on the fact of who we say this man is. He is not just one who teaches us good things. He is not just bread of life. He is the great I am who is the bread of life. I am the bread of life. You, you get what I'm saying? So we read that and we go, I am. Well, that just means I am. You know, he is. It's more than that. He's saying he's God. 
And so now we understand he's saying he's God, but, but what does he came to, to do? That there's more happening here through John. Every single time in John we see this, there's this pattern that takes place. Jesus says or does something, then there's opposition and frustration. Because we're about to look at their responses, it wasn't good. From all of them. Opposition and frustration. Then Jesus claims, I am. Everybody say, I am. And then people must decide who he is. Isn't it interesting the pattern that, that is laid out in the book of John is the pattern that all of us have to come to face to face with. It's the same decision we have to make. Every single time, the very reason Jesus came to be the great I am, but then let's see, what does he offer? Anybody want to know what Jesus offers? It says bread. And before you get excited, this is more than just a snack. I'm in. Snacks. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Number one, the bread of life is the only thing that can save you. The bread of life is the only one, the only thing that can save you. We know that the whole purpose of, of the book of John was written for people to understand life and that Jesus is the one that can save you. We know this because in John 20, 31, he says, but these are written. So he, John says that all of this stuff was written so that you may continue to believe. So the purpose of, of him coming, the purpose of providing bread for us was life. Bread equals life. And just like bread fills our stomach and brings nourishment to our life, Jesus is the only one that can save us. Number two, the thing that he's saying is Jesus or the bread of life is the only one, the only one that can satisfy you. I want to just declare this over you. Maybe you've never heard this truth or maybe you've heard it a million times, but you need to hear it today. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy you. And here's what happens. Why is that so important to emphasize? Because you and I jump from relationship to relationship, job to job, hobby to hobby, social media platform to another social media platform. We jump around looking every single day for purpose and significance when it's right in front of us. He is the only one. He is the bread of life and the only one. He saves us, but he satisfies us. I just want to ask you a question. Can you just do a check right now in your heart? Are you satisfied? Are you looking for satisfaction in your spouse when you should be finding it in Jesus and living with your spouse out of the overflow of the satisfaction you find in Jesus? Are you looking for, for satisfaction from when I'm, I'm fully healthy and I don't have any health problems and I don't have to take anything for, for this or that? Is that? Are there things that you're bringing to Jesus? Jesus, if you'll just do this with your hand, then I'm good. When he's really trying to teach you a bigger thing, that he is God and he wants to save you and satisfy the longing in your heart. Man, you can go to church every single weekend. You can have your kids in church. You can do all the Christian stuff, but miss the point of being close to the great I am, but never allowing him to satisfy the desire in your heart. Check this out. If he is God, he is creator. He was there when the world was created. That means the created, the, the, the creator is the only one that can fill the void in the created. What happens is the enemy dupes us in to trying to fill the void in us with things that are created. And created things, even good things, can't fill the void in one who is created. It requires, I know this is early, but stay with me. It requires the creator filling the void in the created. That's where satisfaction comes from. And, and you go, why, why, is this, why is this so hard for us to grasp? Because the enemy wants to keep you searching for where Jesus is because we're not satisfied with who Jesus is. We want something else to replace what Jesus is. Jesus is trying to talk to them about eternal satisfaction and they just want their bellies filled. And some of us are okay, I know this is strong teaching, <laughs> but some of us are okay with our bellies being filled if our heart's not full. 
But Jesus didn't just come to give us our fill. Jesus came to make us full. You get what I'm saying? And, and, and I, know, I, I know for the most part, like, we, 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 we think, well, of course he's much more than that. Of course he's, he, he, he's this. But there is this inconsistency and an ebb and flow, like a, a, not a healthy ebb and flow, but like this, I'm in, I'm out. I'm in, I'm out. And it's like this, almost this schizophrenic believer type mentality that leaves us kind of lost and confused. And if we're kind of lost and confused at what we're really going to be satisfied with, what do you think the people around us are saying when they see our lives? There, there needs to be a consistency. Where does the consistency, and, and it doesn't come from, well, shame on you. No, Jesus came to say shame off of you. So if you're feeling, well, woe is me, that's, not the, that's, that's a trick because that just leads back to more shame. Jesus said shame off of you. So that you can walk victorious and lean in to where he's leading us to go. And, and so he saves us, he satisfies us, but then, but then it goes even more that, that when we believe in the breath of life, when we believe in the bread of life, he is the only one that can sustain us. So he gets us to where we need to be, but there is this strength and consistency. Anybody in the room glad he saved you and you don't have to go back to where you were. What is that called? Sustained. I'm not who I used to be. Why? Not because of the great you is, but because of the great I am. I no longer connect with that anymore. I no longer am familiar with that. What was once familiar is now foreign. That's the wrong, that's the, the, the trouble sometimes with a sustained life because we, we get familiar with things that ought to be foreign. And we've got to remember, church, we're not from here. This is a different world. This is a different place that we're from. And, and, and when he said, I am the great I am, what he was saying is, yo, I'm not from here. And what's from this world will not sustain you because you're going to get your fill. But guess what happens? It's like when you eat Chinese food or when you have a teenager. Man, we ate this giant meal yesterday, one of our favorite restaurants. I was so, I was so, I mean, if I was a tick, I'd have popped. Amy hates that picture. We get home, an hour later, Timothy walks into the kitchen, heats up Raymond noodles. He's eating, he's eating ramen. We called it Raymond growing up. He, why? Because what was there wasn't, any, it wasn't there anymore. Some of us, believe enough in Jesus to get fit, to, 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 to get full, to go, yes, I, I believe I'm going to heaven. But do you realize that he wants to sustain you day in and day out? That when you wake up in the morning, he's there. It's a new morning. There is new mercy. There is new things. There are things that he wants to lead you. It says goodness and mercy are following you all the days of your life. How can you be in a desperate situation and lean into the Lord like never before? Because he's the only one that can sustain you. He's the only one that saves me, but he's also the only one that satisfies the longing in my heart. As much as I love her and as fine of a woman as she is, she cannot satisfy the longings in my heart. She did not complete me. She compliments me. And some of us have been married 30 years waiting on the man or the woman to fulfill something in us that God is the one that can fulfill in us. If she leaves tomorrow, I'm going to be okay. It might take a minute. Because she fills a large part. But it's the creator that makes me whole. It's the creator that sets me free. It's the creator who makes me who I am. Because any one of us can go nutso and crazo and, and all those other O's at any point. You need one who remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his name is Jesus. And the same is true for me, you know, we, we have people in our lives, but God never designed people to fill a role in us that, 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 that only he was designed to do. Or situations or circumstances, as volatile as this world is and as crazy and uncertain, you, you think that who you vote for for president is gonna save you and sustain you and satisfy you? 
Come on, I think we've been sucking wind long enough to realize that a political answer is not going to save this world. There is one who saves, satisfies, and, 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 and sustains. His name is Jesus. And we need to pray, and we need to vote biblically, and we need to do that. But if you're giving yourself to all these different things, th there is not an administrative or a political or a government or a social justice in the name of social justice. Listen, Jesus is the beautiful picture of social justice. Follow him, love him, allow him to live his life through you, and you will see justice. Not by holding a banner of anything other than Jesus. And what he was saying is, I'm, I am the great, I am, and I am the breath of life. I am the bread of life. We'll get to breath later on in the series. But I am the bread of life. I am here to save you, to, 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 to satisfy you, to sustain you. Four responses. Some of the people complained about Jesus. Look at what he did when they complained. Verse 43, uh, yeah, verse 43, same chapter. But Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said. I love his bluntness, don't you? They're complaining, you know what, Jesus? Well, they're just, they're just, they're just doing you, boo. Everybody's got a right to complain. No, they don't. Jesus said, stop complaining about what I just said. Why don't you lean in and think about what I said and try to complain instead of complaining about it? I ain't pointing fingers, but that'll help somebody today if you just stop complaining about what Jesus said. You know, a lot of times that's our response when Jesus says hard things like this. We complain. That that's what they did. They they started fussing about it. They they said, This is this is crazy. Some of us just need this, this one verse, but in that, Jesus says, stop complaining. Here's the victory in that. Jesus encourages us to move past our feeling, and he calls us to faithfulness. We don't live by feeling, we live by faith. You can psychoanalyze that all you want, but if you live by your feeling, by complaining, by voicing things that are not righteous, just because you feel it does not mean you need to say it. Just because you feel it does not mean it's truth. I would bear to say that most of the time it's not. That somewhere in there it is, but, but it's not ready to, to come out. That we need to bring that to the Lord and we need to trust our complaining to Him. Are there things that, that, that would get frustrating? Yes. Are there things that are hard to swallow? Yes. I don't know if you've ever done this. They were complaining because of what Jesus said. Sometimes I'm reading the Bible and I'm not cheering, I'm complaining. Because I'm like, this is really hard. It steps, it hurts my feelings. The Bible hurts my feelings. <laughs> And if it doesn't hurt your feelings, you're not reading the whole thing. Well, I just skipped the parts that challenge me. When the pastor communicates the word of God, I'm not talking about meddling or being offensive, but when the pastor or our leaders around us communicate the word of God, sometimes it should offend us. There should be this thing inside of us that goes, ouch, that hurts the things in me that it ought to hurt. But, but how many of us sometimes protect the things that ought to be stepped on? We protect the things that ought to be submitted before the Lord and submitted before the Word of God. Listen, we need a generation that's not worried about the, God, the Word of God offending us. We should be more concerned with offending the Word of God than the Word of God offending us. What if we read it and studied it like it's life, like it's bread, like it, just like when you, you're going to pull up to, to the Mexican restaurant today and you're going to eat four tacos when you should eat two, five. It's in your blood. Taco is not English. But you see what I'm saying? We make room and space for the things that are important to us. We will grow past, you know, when Amy does things that tick me off, it, we've been married 22 years almost, and she's only done three things. Yeah. She's only done three things. They stopped clapping at that. Three things that have, that have bothered me. But in those three things, had I thrown in the towel? I wonder how many of us close our Bibles or we throw in the towel or we leave the church and we go to another one. What if we leaned in? 
instead of leaned out of the boat? What if we decided to put roots down and go, man, there's probably a reason the Word of God is challenging me. It's because God wants to grow me up, because He's a good Father, because He wants to bring out the best in me, get the worst out of me and bring out the best in me. It's called discipleship. Welcome to the body of Christ. It's called growth. Welcome to the body of Christ. It's, it, it's, it's called a full life, not a filled life. And so complaining, and then the other one is they were confused. This was some of the disciples, y'all. They said back to Jesus, some of this is just too hard. Some of this is just too hard to grasp. It's confusing. Sometimes there are things that are confusing, but, but just like if there's a man in the room that's ever been confused by a woman, give me an amen. But aren't they wonderful? But they're confusing. Guess, let me, stay with me. Had we given up on what was confusing and never leaned in to try to understand, we would never see fruitfulness in things given birth to. The human race would collapse. Do you know what will happen with your faith if you don't lean into things that you don't understand? If you just run and quit when you don't understand instead of leaning in and finding out, God, what are you wanting to show me? God, what, how are you wanting to reveal something to me? You've been a Christian 30 years. You know there's more where that came from. Jesus is better. Who is this man? He is the better man. He is God. He is the bread of life. And so, so watch this. You're, there's going to be times that you complain. We're people. There's going to be times where we get confused. But don't let that stop you from pursuing because if you embrace complaining and you embrace confusion, you, it leads to our third response, which is detrimental to our faith and our life, is we, we take Jesus casually. All of a sudden we get casual about the thing that we should be very serious about. We're casual, I'm a casual Christian. Hey, I'm casual. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just casual. This was heartbreaking for Jesus. Because while he was fully God, he was fully man, and he desperately loved the world that he came to. And I don't know what he was feeling in that moment, but I know it wasn't good. And he looks at the 12 disciples because many at the answer to what Jesus was saying deserted him because he claimed that he was God, because he claimed that he was the one that could give them life. They deserted him. They turned their backs on Jesus and walked away. And Jesus looks at the 12 disciples and he just looks at them and he says, are you gonna go too? And I believe Jesus is looking at the church today and there are many complaining. There are many confused. The response isn't because of life, it's because of what Jesus says. It isn't because of how bad it is out there, it's because of how good it could be for us if we would just believe what he says. We're in search of power instead of presence. And he's standing before the church and he says, are you going to desert me too and Peter says one of the most profound statements in all of the Bible y'all Peter got it wrong a lot but this one is where Peter got it right and Peter looks at Jesus and he says where else would we go you have the words of eternal life where else would we go? You are the only one that can save us. You're the only one that can satisfy us. You're the only one that can sustain us. Where else would we go? Peter wasn't saying that there wasn't two billion answers and other things that we could go to. He was saying that out of all the two billion Google searches, there is one, there is one, the great I am. There is one who is the breath of life. There is one who is the bread that will sustain you. It doesn't say, listen, we know Peter. We know he complained. We know he got confused. But he didn't allow it to make him take Jesus casually. 
You know why? Because he was after who he was, not just what he could do. Where else would we go? How, how is our response today? Jesus, where else would we go? Where else would we go? You are the, you have the words of eternal life. What, what is this? It's, it's the response we need to have, a committed, a committed life to Jesus. What does a committed life to Jesus look like? And I want to encourage you today, man, there, there are so many ways you can commit. The first one is to say yes to Jesus for the very first time. If you've never committed your life to him, the Bible calls that salvation. Where you say to him for the first time, or, or maybe you come back to him and you just say, man, how could, I, how could I not say yes to him? Last weekend in our Easter services in Good Friday, we saw 127 people say yes to Jesus. And that's the, that's the ones we know about. Maybe you need to join them and say, man, I need a committed relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you say, man, I am taking him casual and it's time to be committed. I'm ready to lean in, ready to be committed. And here's, here's some great ways you can do that. Show up at Grow Nights in May. Tell Jesus and tell your church, I'm ready to lean in and grow in this relationship with Jesus. Great way to do that. Maybe today, you need to get baptized and you're ready. I'm ready to follow Jesus in baptism. I'm ready. I'm ready to live a committed life before him. I'm don't, I don't want to just tell Jesus in my heart. I'm ready to tell it and shout to the world. I am committed. I belong to him. It took guts when the hundreds of people deserted Jesus that day. It took guts for at least 12 men to stand by Jesus and say, we are committed. They gave up their life for it. It's what it requires. Jesus, where else would we go? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Are you here today and you need to say yes to him? Are you here today and you just need to say yes again? Jesus, I, I come, I believe in you. Again, out of all the Google searches of who is this man, he is so much more than a good teacher. He is life. And today, do you need to trust your life to him? The Bible says that there's one thing required, believe in the one he sent. And today, are you ready to believe in him? We're not gonna embarrass you or call you out. I'm not gonna make you say anything or come up here. We're not gonna do anything to embarrass you. This is about you and your heart giving it to Jesus. Do you need to say yes to him for the first time or come back home to him today? Whether you're in the room or online, will you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? That's me, Michael, today I need to say yes to Jesus. Today, thank you, thank you. I need to recommit my life to him. I'm going all in, I'm ready to, to, to resubmit my life to him. If you're watching online, you can just put, maybe you can DM us there. Or you can put something in the comment bar that says, yes, that's me. I'm, I'm praying this prayer today. And I'm going to give you some words to say as you commit your life to him. You can pray this in your heart, but just pray it with all your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you are God, that you really did come and that you came to give me life. And when I eat of you and drink of you, that I'll never grow hungry or thirsty again. And so will you come right now and save me? Will you fill this place in my heart that only you can fill? I thank you that the relationship, personal and intimate, begins right now. A life full of purpose and meaning comes from a relationship with you that starts today. And thank you that one day when I breathe my last breath here, I'll see you face to face in a place called heaven that you've prepared for me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for coming for me. I don't, I don't desert today. I don't run the other way today. I run to you. You are my Savior. You are the Savior of the world. And today you're my personal Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said amen. Amen.